week's episode is brought to you by Support the Mountain's Herbal Parasite Cleanse. This formula targets the small and large intestinal tracts and larvae, the most broad-spectrum formula available today. 100% organic, formulated by Dr. Mikio Sanki, author of the Esoteric Acupuncture Series. For 10% off your first bottle, visit shopyogahub.com and use the coupon code CLEANSE at checkout. Hello and welcome to YHTV's Magical Medical Tour. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Christina Souza Ma, and our topic today is Burns, Spirituality, and Speed. As we go deep into the doctor's bag with our wonderful medical guide, Dr. Glenn Woolman. Hello, Dr. Woolman. Hello, Christina. How are you? <laughs> that be the doc's bag. <laughs> that, is, that is the bag. Does anyone ever carry those around anymore? Um, I do. But sometimes, actually, when I go on uh, house calls, <laughs> sometimes it's actually embarrassing. I just find a, you know, a Trader Joe's or a Whole Foods bag, and I throw a bunch of things into it. And <laughs> <laughs> I don't look uh, totally professional. But uh, sometimes I carry the doctor's bag. I don't see too many doctors doing that anymore, especially since there's so much equipment now. Yeah. Uh, but nowadays, you can take just your <clears throat> iPad. That's right. And it's, and it's got everything on it. It has ultrasound and electrocardiograms and otoscopes. And isn't that crazy? I love it. it, I it wish... It's really magnificent, isn't it? <laughs> it really is. I wish I had that in uh, medical school and during all of my training. Yeah. Oh. Greetings, everybody. Welcome to Magical Medical Tour. I'm Dr. Glenn Wallman. I will be your medical guide along with Christina today as we travel through another quadrant of the healthcare galaxy in search of optimal health. And I do want to say today that uh, as part of the talk, we're going to include some slides or some photos. And uh, mm -hmm. so in many cases where many of you listen to this as a podcast while you're driving or doing something else, this might be one you want to actually watch uh, to see some of the slides. Mm -hmm. And I will say at this time, uh, some of them are a little graphic. Yes. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, a number of topics today. The first one will be about burns. Then we're going to talk about spirituality a little bit. And then we're going to talk about uh, speed. And I, <laughs> Which can cover a lot. <laughs> it should cover a lot. <laughs> like my life. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that that's, that could be the title for your life. There you go. <laughs> Burns, spirituality, and speed. Oh, boy. So I just want to remind everyone at any time during the show, you can feel free to ask a question or make a comment simply by scrolling down in your screen and typing it into the comment box. Or if you're actually listening to this as a podcast, just give us a call. Drop us a line at 818-LET'S-TALK. 818-LET'S-TALK. And be sure to leave your contact info if you want us to call you back with any answers. Okay, thanks then. Oh, you're quite welcome, and thank you. And, and of course, people can always send in to us if they have a topic. We've received a couple of requests for a few topics that in 2015, I've already got some plans for uh, some of these topics. Someone had requested a topic on pain management, so we're going to be speaking with some pain specialists. Mm, great. And we have a lot of categories that we are looking forward to in 2015. And I want to remind everyone that uh, Segovia did a great job compiling the 2014 health tips. So anybody that missed uh, any of the shows, it's always fun to just listen to the health tips. They're really profound and they give lots of great information. <laughs> All within one shot. <laughs> All within one shot. Pretty amazing. Yes. Pretty amazing. So today, Christina, we're gonna, going to start with um, the topic burns. And uh, I always like to think about things that might help people and burns mm. uh, are a category that, uh, you know, people can be afflicted by them and they can cause lots of problems or minor problems. Mm -hmm. And I thought I would just give some information on burns today and then a few other topics. And so I will say that before we talk about burns, I want to say that we're going to be mainly talking about burns to the skin and 
we will eventually have a dermatologist on who's going to teach us much more about the skin. We'll go into it, so to speak, in depth. Mm. But I do want to just give a brief uh, description of the skin. And you can see a slide. We'll be showing a slide just to show the skin is basically composed of three major layers. You've always heard of the epidermis. That's the first layer. And that um, that is about... In thickness, it's about 0 0.05 millimeters at its thinnest area, which would be around the eyelid. And it goes to up to about 1.5 millimeters, which would be maybe on the palms of your hands, the soles of your feet. Then below that layer is the dermis. And the dermis contains lots of blood vessels and a number of other things, nerves, trans through there and the hair cells transport through there. Uh, they usually measure, uh, again, varies in size, about 0.3 millimeters on the eyelid. So it's a little thicker than the epidermis and then about 3.0 millimeters on the back. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then we have the final area, which is the subcutaneous tissue. This is deeper than the epidermis and dermis. And this has the subcutaneous fat. It's got connective tissue. It's got blood vessels, a number of other parts to it. And then deep to that are muscles. And then we have uh, bone. So that's, that's kind of a picture of what the skin looks like. But it's, it's really a complex organ. In fact, it's the largest organ in the body. Uh, and aside from being just a baggie to hold all of our guts <laughs> <laughs> and blood vessels and bones and everything else. But that's kind of what it sounded like when you were saying three millimeter, you know, it's like, yeah, exactly. that's exactly how they grade the Ziploc bags and everything. <laughs> right, it's a three millimeter with a Ziploc. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it, it's fascinating as an organ and it's got so many complex parts to it and so many interesting things that... Uh, I want to dedicate a whole show to uh, the skin. But for now, we'll just leave it at, at kind of that. Although, as part of its functions, the skin is obviously the, the bag that holds it all together. And then it's a protective barrier. Uh, it protects us from all the toxic elements out in, out in the world, heat and cold and wind and water, things like that. It also uh, is a sensory organ. You know, when you touch different parts of your skin, uh, you can uh, feel light touch, sharp touch, deep pressure, tickling, all of these things. It's also, it's also part of the immune system. Uh, it's the first defense that we have for the immune system. So when things happen to the skin, uh, dangerous things like burns, uh, it can disrupt the whole process. It also uh, balances our temperature and water. You know, when we always talk about if somebody gets too hot, then you start sweating through the skin. And so it, it has many purposes and many functions. And part of the process is if you burn yourself, depending on how bad the burn is, it can eliminate some of these functions, which can be uh, not too big a deal if it's in one minor area, but if it's in a major area or over a large area then it can cause lots of problems and uh, misfunction. So let's talk about uh, burns for a moment. Uh, let's start with a definition of a burn. A burn is basically an injury to tissue, and it can be caused by heat. And this heat could be from liquids, like hot water or hot oil. It could be gases. It could be solids, like a hot stove or a piece of burning wood or a pot. Fire certainly causes it friction. If you ru ru are rubbed against a carpet or something like that, you can cause a friction burn. Electricity can cause a burn, uh, and electricity can be uh, either from a cord in the house or it could be from lightning. Uh, you can also get radiation burns, radiation from the sun, radiation from x-rays. Uh, if you're getting a chest x-ray, you usually won't get a burn, but if you're having radiation treatment for a cancer, there is a burn involved in that. And there are certain, there is also chemical burns, you know, alkalis and acids, things like that. Got that? Yes, yes. Now, now, are there like I, I think of like cold ice burn or freezer burn or 
frostbite. You know, frostbite. Yeah. Is that considered a burn? It is actually considered a burn, uh, although it's the temperature is down. It, it disrupts and injures the tissue and causes mm. damage, and it causes a burn. And we're going to, I'm glad you brought up the ice, because uh, many people believe that that's, that's the, one of the major treatments for a burn when you get a burn to put ice on it. And we're going to dispel that myth a little bit later on. Oh, good. <laughs> well, although I think, I guess I just dispelled it. Yeah. yeah. So, so, um, but it's good to hear from a doctor. Yes. Because people look at me really funny and go, no, put ice on it. I'll go, no. <laughs> well, and, and I'll try and give a little bit of an explanation as to why that happens uh, as we get to it. So, when we look at burns in the emergency department, there are, again, we usually talk about the burns and describe them in many ways. Everybody has heard of burns and degrees, the first degree burn, second degree burn, third degree burn, but what does that mean? Uh, so we look at burns and we talk about degrees. We also look at burns and we talk about surface area, uh, how much of the body and to what area uh, was actually covered by the burn. You know, is it on the face? Is it over a joint? Is it over the genitals? Things like that. These are all important. So when we describe burns, it's important to get an idea of the degree, which we'll go into in a minute, and then the surface area where it is, and also what caused the burn. Uh, was it from a chemical or was it from uh, a fire or a cigarette, something else, or liquid. And then uh, we certainly want to know the health of the person. So when we look at burns, uh, we start to discuss uh, the degrees of a burn. And we could see another slide which shows basically some of the degrees of, of the burn on a simple uh, schematic scale. A first degree burn, interestingly, is uh, it's the lightest burn, it's the most superficial. Usually, you can imagine just like a sunburn or you spilled a little bit of hot water uh, on a small area. So, But the first degree burn is probably the most painful, but it's the most superficial. Mm. And that covers basically just the epidermis, which we learned is the first layer of the skin mm. uh, or the outer layer of the skin. And interestingly, the first layer of the skin, the epidermis actually is broken up into five layers on its own. And the deepest or the base layer of the skin, all of the cells, if you looked under a microscope, they would look like columns, long, tall columns. And as these uh, columns produce and reproduce, they keep pushing up to the more superficial layers in the epidermis. And as the cells get closest to the surface, they start flattening out from the columns. Mm -hmm. And by the time they get up to the surface of the epidermis, they're mostly flat. And they're actually dead. Hmm. So we're, you know, we're being covered. But although we love our skin and we rub things on it and caress it and feel good things about it, it's really uh, flat, dead skin. <laughs> so it's uh, kind of interesting to see that. So that's a first degree burn. If you can imagine a sunburn, that's that's what a first degree burn would look like. Now, now, but, Glenn, you made a comment just now that. This is the most painful of burns? What happens is, if you remember correctly, uh, that the nerves come out to the surface. That's how we feel. We have sensation of light touch and sharpness and pain and everything. So all the nerves are right at the surface mm. and or close to the surface. So when the burn happens, it doesn't destroy the nerves but it aggravates them and you feel them See. very badly. So if you can imagine, though, as we get deeper and deeper into burns, we'll be causing more damage. So the second degree burn still is part of the epidermis, but this is when you start seeing blisters. Mm. Uh, uh, so you see the redness and the blisters, and it's very painful. And these blisters sometimes are filled with uh, a liquid or a fluid, and we'll talk about that in terms of treatment, what to do with that. People always ask questions about what to do with that blister. And then, the, uh, and then it goes down in the second degree burn. Sometimes you can go through the epidermis down into the superficial layers of the dermis, which is the second layer. 
And then we go to second degree burns and third degree burns, where uh, the third degree starts going through the epidermis, through the dermis, and it goes down into the subcutaneous tissue where we have fat cells and that's where hair follicles are and blood vessels and there's lots of connective tissue and the collagen and all of the other things that are there. And usually with a third degree burn, you'll see things like whiteness. Uh, the skin becomes white and maybe even waxy, or you may see charring and it becomes black. Mm. And then finally, the deep third degree and the fourth degree burns are the ones that go through the epidermis, through the dermis, through the subcutaneous tissue and fat, and down to expose and sometimes burn tendons and muscle wow. and and bone. And we even, uh, in certain scientific circles, we always talk about first degree, second, third degree, mm -hmm. and occasionally the fourth degree. But sometimes the uh, the pathologists talk about fifth and sixth degrees, which is actually burning through bone and destroying all sorts of tissue. Most wow. people, Oof. yeah, <laughs> and you can see a picture that we have a picture of a uh, uh, third and fourth degree and burn fourth. where you can see uh, a very good example on the hand. Part of the hand is bandaged. And you see areas, usually when you have some kind of a burn, you have uh, many, if it's a bad burn, you probably have areas where there's first degree burns, areas of second, third, mm -hmm. and fourth degree burns. So you can see those tendons there and even the uh, first examples of bone and some muscle tissue that's been burned away. Nasty. And surprisingly, pretty nasty. <laughs> really right? nasty. Yeah, I know. That's the part I love. <laughs> I was thinking, okay, how do I replicate this in makeup now? <laughs> right. Um, and the, the interesting thing that you brought up before is the fourth degree burn is actually the least painful. Mm. Because Cause everything's of, dead. Everything is dead. <laughs> That's exactly right. Everything is dead. Oh. And most of the time when you get to fourth degree burns, remember we said not only is it the uh, degree of the burn, but the surface area. If you have, uh, I mean, every, everybody probably or most everybody uh, has had a sunburn where it's been over mm. a lot of their body and you survive from that. But if you had a third or a fourth degree burn over your entire body, most people do not survive that. Mm. And if you are uh, semi-fortunate enough to have a really bad fourth-degree burn just on an extremity, uh, you may not die from that, but you will be critical probably, and you will probably lose that extremity. Mm. Wow. You with me on all this so far? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, yes. so <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty intense. So yeah. we want to talk about, uh, you know, the different types of burns, uh, and this goes into basically we talk about prevention of burns when we talk about heat and fire burns. Certainly, you should go around your house and try and fireproof the house. Make sure you have smoke detectors, detectors that are up to date and checked periodically. Some people have suggested that you should check them twice a year, usually around daylight savings time. So if you, when you're trying to figure out whether you fall behind or skip ahead, uh, that's a good time to check your uh, detectors. And also, good idea to have uh, a fire extinguisher in the house, probably one in the kitchen and maybe one in the garage or in a bedroom, something like that, and know how to use them, make sure they're checked out. You should have, uh, just go around the whole house, wherever you have fire, there might be uh, chemicals in the garage or in the kitchen that need to be uh, addressed. And especially we're talking about when kids are around. Mm -hmm. uh, and certainly even if there aren't kids, you should have all of these things. But when kids are around and they get old enough, you should be teaching them many of the things that have to be done to protect against fire, which also includes uh, in a family an escape plan uh, if there is some kind of a fire. And you should also know a little bit about different types of fires and how to put them out. For instance, if you're cooking on a stove and you have a grease fire, you don't want to put water on it, which would be the natural thing to do. Uh, you want to cover it with another pot or a pan or uh, something else. Uh, electrical uh, fires, certainly you want to make sure all your electrical outlets are 
uh, protected, not overloaded. If you do have children, you want to have covers over the uh, electrical out outlets, especially the ones that aren't being used. One of the things that we see in the emergency department, which is uh, very dangerous and sometimes very frightening, is a baby will be crawling along the floor, uh, see an electrical cord, and of course, most yeah. of the time they put things in their mouth, right? They bite through the cord and they get a yeah. burn, an electrical burn, right to the lip, mm is a very dangerous area, but one of the things that happens is these electrical burns, now that uh, our listeners and viewers know, usually go first, second, and sometimes right up to third degree burns. And you may not see it at first, but this burn, uh, electrical burn to the lip, will potentially erode a major blood vessel in the lip. And a child who first starts out looking like it's just a little burn and you want to put some medication on it and that's it. You may want to take them to their doctor because this may suddenly erode and they'll start bleeding out in the middle of the night hmm. and uh, they may not live through that. Shock is certainly an important part of all burns depending on the degree, et cetera, hmm. and the surface area. So also when we're talking about electrical burns, lightning burns, you, uh, oh. you don't want to be out during a thunder and lightning storm. You don't want to carry metal. You don't want to be on a high uh, hilltop. You don't want to be under major trees. You don't want to be in the water. Lots of things like that. Most of it's common sense, and we know all of that. Uh, in terms of liquid burns, there are many things. It could be, obviously, just simply water. And if you're carrying a baby, don't be carrying uh, a glass or a cup of hot coffee or cocoa or tea or anything like that. You don't want to have hot liquids on a table with a tablecloth that a child could just reach up and grab the table and pull this down on them. You don't want to have, if you're cooking, you don't really want to have the child in the room, in the kitchen with you. And if you do, make sure that the handles of pots and pans are not leaning outward uh, so that a child could reach up and grab them because uh, we always used to say this in our chemistry class, hot and cold glass always look the same. Mm. So a child won't know that something is hot until they get the burn. And usually when they get the burn, it's on a hand or something like that. And that becomes uh, very complex and complicating. Um, chemical burns, you know, the, they're usually either an acid or an alkali, and it's good to know the difference in them. Sometimes the treatment is a, a little bit different. But I think that covers some of the preventive things and some of the causes of, mm -hmm. of burns. Any thoughts on your part? Anything before we move forward into treatment? Mm -hmm. Things like that? No, no. Some of them are just so nasty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they are. They Ooh. are. So let's let's talk about treatment. Wow. You're still looking at that photo, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's it's very sad. Um, uh, being working on a burn ward is very enlightening mm. uh, for people. I remember one of my first experiences on a burn ward. A woman had been uh, smoking in bed, and that's obviously another one. Stop smoking, uh, mm. and definitely don't smoke in bed. Woman fell asleep uh, on her couch, got total body burns. She lived through it. Uh, she, it was very painful. She was on a burn ward, and I remember walking in. She was covered in uh, bandages. It looked like a mummy. And I remember the first thing I saw when I walked into this room. It was. It still stays with me. Is here's this woman with second, first, and third degree burns all over her body. Uh, bandaged all up, and I see her struggling to try and bend her arm with the bandages on it to get that cigarette back to her mouth. So wow. that always, is, so that shows the power of uh, the addiction there. But uh, smoking is another thing that we have to worry about. Mm. So when uh, you are home and you see somebody that gets a burn, uh, the first thing to do. Uh, is to get them away from the burn. So if it's something like their clothes are burning, try and get their clothes off of them. Uh, and obviously teaching the uh, thing of uh, drop and roll. You know, when uh, if your clothes are on fire, you should teach your kids to drop and start to roll. Uh, you should get kids uh, 
cover them with a blanket if, if it, there's an actual fire, if there's a scald or if there's a chemical burn or an electrical burn, get them away, but be very careful with electrical burns. You don't want to electrocute yourself. So the first thing to do is try and stop the burn from continuing uh, and happening and stop the exposure. The next thing you want to do is get a person quiet. Uh, and if it's an extensive burn, keep them lying down because shock can happen. But if it just happens to be on a forearm or a finger or something like that, the next thing to do uh, is to put the burn under tepid water. Now, this is where we talk about the ice. Most people immediately want to put ice on a wound, and this is not good. If you think about uh, the science behind a burn, the skin usually is at a temperature of about 98, 99, 98.6. When it goes up to uh, about 105 and above, uh, organs start failing. You know, if you have a fever or something like that, organs can start failing. And at about 120 degrees, uh, you can that's when you can start melting or boiling skin. So another uh, preventive thing to do is make sure that you set your hot water heater to less than 120 degrees, so at least you might be protected there. So once you have the person and they have that burn on their hand, you try to determine the extent of the burn, uh, the, the surface area and what caused it, and you put it under tepid water. Now, some You can use cool water, but you don't want ice cold water. And the reason is that when the skin at its normal temperature gets hit by the burn, it raises the temperature of the skin to a higher degree, let's say 118 or 120 or 150, something like that. Now that the skin is at 150 degrees, if you put ice on it and you change it from 150 and you bring it down to, you know, under 98 or 90 or 70, that change can cause even more problems. So please avoid ice and even avoid cold, cold water. Putting the tepid or cool water on it and running it for 5 to 10 to 15 to even 20 minutes at a time, depending if it's a simple water burn, a hot water burn, for about 10 minutes, 15 minutes. If it's a chemical burn, like an alkali or an acid, where that burn can get deep into the tissue and keep going into the tissue, you want to get as much water on that as possible. So over five-minute increments for about 20 minutes at a time. Uh, are you kind of clear on that? Uh, because that's an important part for me, and I want to make sure that if you get that, I know everyone will get it. Yeah. And so, so what I'm hearing is like run the run the wound underwater five minutes at a time uh, with fit, like ten ten minute increments. Is that right? Do it for five minutes at a time, and right. then stop for a moment or two uh, to relax, and then do it again. So that you get, depending on the type of burn, like mm -hmm. I said, for a, a water burn or a sunburn, different than an alkali burn. You know, if you have lye in your in your garage and you're using it, or some chemicals, weed killers, and things that have uh, very powerful acids and alkali, that needs to be done for at least 20 minutes. And it also cleans the wound a little bit. But one of the things that we learned already is a first degree burn is the most painful. Right. So by putting it under the uh, tepid or cool water, you have the opportunity to relieve some of the pain. Mm, okay. The next thing to do as uh, you go through it is to uh, determine, is there um, any foreign bodies in the burn. If you had a burn to your clothing, your clothing went on fire, some of that, some of the cotton or silk or whatever your clothing is may be embedded in the burn. And by washing it, sometimes that will relieve it. If you see the burn and you see clothing around it and you can remove clothing around the burn, do that. But if there is some material inside the burn, I usually recommend that you go to the doctor and let them do it under surgical or sterile conditions. Mm. So that's very important. And then, depending, again, if it's a first-degree burn, you want to take something, you could put some lotions on it, 
Uh, this is another myth. Put butter on it, put lard on it, put fat on it. Those are not good to put on it because you need the area to be able to breathe and get oxygen, and sometimes that will close it off. If you close the area off, there's the possibility that an infection will occur, and we certainly don't want an infection to occur. So avoid, first of all, the ice, and then second, the butter, the lard, the fat. After you've cleaned it off, uh, then you may want to put a light dressing on it with a uh, some kind of a solution or a lotion. Uh, if you see that it's an open wound, you want to maybe put uh, an antibiotic ointment in, over it and cover it loosely uh, with clean, sterile gauze pads. And these pads should be uh, changed multiple times a day so that you can, one, check the wound uh, to see that it's not getting infected. And by taking the dressing on and off, sometimes that dressing will pick mm -hmm. up some dead material mm -hmm. and remove its less chance of, a, of an infection. Mm. And then keep doing that. And if it remains a first degree burn in a simple area where it's not co too complex, uh, then you can keep watching it and it should get better over time. If it's a second degree burn and you see blister formation, there was always arguments about this. Leave mm -hmm. the blister, don't leave the blister. Uh, and it being in emergency medicine, we went through our own changes in this. So when we would see people come in to the emergency department with various types of burns, uh, we would see the blisters. At first, we always thought, leave the blisters because it's part of the healing mechanism. But what we're learning now is that the the blister is a reaction and it's the body trying to protect itself and the fluid within the blister are usually inflammatory uh, fluids that are a reaction to protect the body but those inflammatory fluids over time can actually keep the wound from healing so if you feel comfortable and you have the ability to have sort of a sterile condition either a sterile needle or a very sharp sterile scissor and it's not too big of a blister, uh, I recommend uh, popping and opening the blister and allowing the liquid to drain off. Now for the first, after you do that, I always leave the blister skin on for maybe one more day because it serves as its own barrier. Mm -hmm. But after the first day, that, that tissue starts dying on its own and it becomes a nidus for infection. So if you have the ability to take that uh, dead blister tissue away, then do that. And again, continuing every day to clean it out and put on more uh, dressings until it gets better. I always say that if you have any question whatsoever, always good to either contact your doctor or go to the nearest urgent care or emergency department. And the more of a degree of the burn or the more of the type of burn it is, uh, chemical versus, say, hot water or electrical uh, versus, say, just a, a hot pan, uh, then it's important probably to go to emergency department and get it resolved because uh, the sooner that you start taking care of it, the better prognosis and the less complications that can occur. Now, complications can be anything from just pain and limitation of motion to scarring to going into shock if there's a major area of burn surface, uh, losing blood. And if you have other uh, problems, let's say you're in a fire in your home, you could have smoke inhalation. So you could have internal burns from the heated uh, air number of things can happen. So my statement is always, if there's any question, get it looked at by a professional, because you may end up, if it's a second, uh, a really deep second degree burn or a third or fourth degree burn, you may end up needing to be in a special uh, area, critical care, and you may even need to be in a more specialized area, like a burn unit or a burn ward, where these people are uh, professionally trained to deal with all the different aspects of a burn. We talked about, a, uh, we had an interview with John Tessman about hyperbaric chambers. Mm. Uh, and hyperbaric uh, medicine is a very good part of healing for certain types of burns. Certainly, you don't necessarily need it for a first-degree small sunburn. 
but for 30, 40, 50% body area, very important. One of the things uh, that we also talk about in treatments uh, are the alternative treatments. You know, we have the normal things, the cooling, the ointments, the antibiotic ointments, the pain medications like Tylenol or aspirin or the anti-inflammatory NSAIDs like ibuprofen or Advil. But there are some homeopathic remedies that uh, probably Dana Ullman or Lori Grossman, when we interviewed them, they probably talked about those in, in the shows. But you could speak if you have a homeopathic doctor. Uh, there are some treatments for burns that can be used. Also some botanicals. Certainly most of us have now heard about aloe, and I recommend that everybody get an aloe plant. And if you do get an aloe plant and you get a burn, it's you should learn how to use the aloe plant, uh, what part of the plant to use, and what's the best way to put it on. There's another botanical, calendula, which is also uh, good for burns. But before you do that, you should learn about it. You should research it and learn how to use it. One of the things that people are using in wound care now is uh, honey. Uh, but it's a specialized honey. It's not honey that comes in a little teddy bear or, <laughs> or or something that you get in your market. There's a Manuka honey that comes out of New Zealand, and there's a honey that Germans, uh, German physicians and scientists are using. I think it's called Medi honey. So look into these and learn about them. Have them in a kit that you should have uh, in the house, and you should have in a first aid kit when you travel. And everybody should be. Uh, aware of this. So those are the uh, symptoms and those are the causes and some of the treatments that we have. We talked about a little bit about prevention, uh, things like that. One of the things that was important for us uh, in the emergency department is to be aware of child and elder abuse. Uh, we would see a young child come in where uh, someone from the family actually uh, undressed the child and sat them on an electrical stove. Uh, and you, we would see these burns on areas of the body that would make no sense for a child to get a burn. So we're always in the emergency department looking for the possibility uh -huh. of child abuse and elder abuse. Most of the time it doesn't happen, but we've seen uh, cigarette burns all over a child. That makes mm. no sense, right? Mm. So when you see something like that, it alerts us. And most of the time when we see something like that, uh, we will admit the child to get them out of the environment that they're in at mm -hmm. this point. Um, mm. So what do you think? What's your thoughts and what do you do for burns? Wow. Well, I, I usually do the aloe plant. <laughs> Definitely not eyes, but uh, I think that the the worst burn I've ever gotten was the second degree where it blisters up. Mm -hmm. And in those, I, I think I was so young in those days that that uh, we didn't do a thing. And I I, I think I've I have I've had about two of those burns before in my life. You know, one it was wonderful. I spilt a whole. Um, I'd say about two liters of boiling water wow. uh, down the front of my uniform because I was going to school in those days. And it was a uniform, so I had a skirt on. And the very few times I do have a skirt on. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, those were like elastic waistband skirts. Mm -hmm. So we couldn't get it off fast enough. So the 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 skin blistered up, of course. <laughs> Right. And the rubbing of that elastic, you know how the elastic goes in and out, sure. actually ripped up the blister almost immediately. Right. And I have to say that scar, that scar must have lasted about 30 years of my life, right across my stomach. <laughs> yeah. It was good. It was a good scar. <laughs> yeah, nice work. Lots of good stories. Yes, yes. Needless to say, I had a good excuse not to wear a skirt for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So Be before uh, you know, I, you you made me think of another part that I want to talk about uh, is what happens when you have the burn and you decide you're going to the doctor's office. Uh, there are th certain things you can do to prepare for your doctor visit. Mm. 
you, you should know what caused the burn. And if it was a chemical burn, mm -hmm. uh, if you could bring the box or chemical in uh, to show the doctor, uh, that's an important, uh, you know, how, what was the exposure time? How long, when did it happen? Uh, if you're talking to your doctor on the phone, you could talk about the size of the burn and the location of the burn. And speaking of location of the burn, I would say it's very important in certain areas, you should not even hesitate to go to the hospital. Uh, and these areas would be on the face, around the eyes, over the mouth, ears, nose, uh, on the fingers or toes over the genitalia or on the buttocks, uh, those are very important areas. And, and along any joint, so elbow, wrist, shoulder, because if, if it's a deep burn, uh, it has the potential to damage tissue underneath, as mm -hmm. we see in those pictures. Scars can occur. You may end up needing surgical, uh, what we call debridement, which is a very fancy word for cutting away bad tissue and trying to save as much good tissue mm -hmm. as possible. And your prognosis depends on many things. One, what caused the burn? Uh, two, what did you do right away? How long before you got treatment? How deep was the burn? How extensive in a surface area was the burn? Uh, are you getting... Uh, excellent treatment in a burn ward, or are you in a rural area where the treatment may not be as sophisticated? They may not have a hyperbaric chamber, for example. Uh, you may need uh, skin grafts. That's mm -hmm. certainly something uh, that is important. I remember when I was in, I started medical school, uh, there was a person that was being treated on the plastic surgery uh, ward. This was a man that was walking on the street and an electrical telephone wire, you know, one of the wires broke off and came down and hit him in the face, mm. right in the face. And it literally melted his entire face. He had no face anymore. So over many years and many surgical procedures with grafting uh, and everything else, they were trying to build this man a face. So from the very beginning of medical school, four years later, I was still watching this man show oh up gosh. periodically where, oh, today, you know, this month they're making ears for him. And this month or this year, he's going to get a nose or he's going to get lips or things like that. Mm. So only his, his skeletal structure stayed intact? Yes. Yes. What about his sight, his eyes? His eyes were okay. He got lucky wow. there. Wow. He was very lucky there. Wow. But it was, it was pretty impressive. Uh, also, when you're going to the doctor, you certainly want to uh, tell the story, you know, so the doctor can look for other things. You come in, there was a fire in the house, and you've got a burn. Well, you want to talk about the possibility of smoke inhalation. You don't want to treat the burn and send the person home, and a day later, they're in severe respiratory distress, they're, the insides of their lungs have been burned. So mm. if you know there was a possibility of smoke inhalation, then that's important to tell the doctor. And you also want to tell the doctor about your general health. You know, are you a patient that's on immunosuppressants because you're, uh, you have cancer, or you have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or you have heart problems, all of these things are very important to uh, relate to the doctor. Mm. Ah, so, you know, um, with, with chemical burns, mm -hmm. Glenn, which is, um, uh, you know, of course we read on the package quite, quite often, you know, if you get in contact with your eyes or it gets ingested, do this, this, and this and contact a doctor. Right. I mean, I guess it would depend on the kind of chemical burn it would be, right? If, if, if you're not sure, I mean, of course you're going to go to emergency, hopefully if there's one close by. <laughs> right. And if not, let's just say there is not a like you're, you're in a rural area or you're out camping and something happens like a child picks up some liquid from the car and, and decides to drink it, et cetera. What, what do you do? Well, if, if you know what the liquid is, 
and they actually take it internally, you're going to have to get them to a hospital. Try and, uh, depending on what it is, if it's a solid, and depending on the type of solid, sometimes you induce vomiting mm -hmm. to get it out, but sometimes you don't want to induce the vomiting because you're just exposing it to more esophageal areas and back mm -hmm. up into the mouth and throat. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, acids and alkalis burn differently. Mm -hmm. Usually alkalis are worse. When we saw people with acid burns to their eye, usually the acid will go maybe a layer or two, unless it's an extremely strong acid and there's a high content and a large amount. But the alkali burns always were worse, where mm -hmm. they would continue burning deeper and deeper. So washing it out and just rinsing it and diluting it to the best degree you possibly can. Mm, mm, mm. So with generally like with water, right? Straight water. Okay. Straight water. Uh, that's what you want to use because sometimes if you use something else, you can cause another chemical reaction, right. which can cause more heat and burning. Okay. All right. And, and of course, you know, I'm like, so leery of water these days too, that come out of our taps because of the amount of chlorine that's in it. <laughs> That's okay. In this particular case, uh, chlorine will be okay uh, for this when you look at the other possibilities. Mm -hmm. And you can also try and call poison control or your fire department. Mm. It's not a bad idea to, mm. you know, go visit your fire department, uh, you know, a local fire department and talk with the uh, professionals there. They'll give you lots of great hints of things to do around your house. And sometimes, um, actually, you can get... Uh, fire departments to come over and look at your house and go through it and give you suggestions on things that you might uh, want to do to mm -hmm. uh, prevent fires and, and be more careful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good idea. Yes. Yeah. So I think we've covered burns. Mm -hmm. uh, anything else you want to know about burns before we go on to our next part? No, no. I think, yeah, I think you've done such a thorough job. Oof. There's there's always more. There's always more, of course. <laughs> right. So let's go, let's go to uh, shift uh, gears a little bit. We always talk about my six categories: nutrition, exercise, stress management, sleep mm -hmm. management, patterns of behavior, and spirituality. And over the years, we've discussed many aspects of uh, a lot of them to. Uh, try and improve optimal health. And I've most of the time I've stayed away from spirituality because it's so uh, interestingly unique and individualized. But I decided to talk a little bit about spirituality today uh, as an aspect of optimal health. And let's talk about what I mean by spirituality. Well, we talk about body, mind, and spirit, right? Mm-hmm. So the body for me is uh, how apropos, it's from the skin within and back to the skin. Everything that we can look at under a microscope, cut out uh, in a surgical procedure or something like that, that's the body. The mind to me is a, a product of the body that allows us to communicate with ourself and with others. Simply that at this moment in time. And of course, everyone may have other definitions. And spirituality for me is uh, the way of connecting to the bigger picture, putting ourselves in the big picture of the universe. How do we fit in? Uh, how do we ground ourselves? How do we center ourselves? And spirituality to me is also uh, encompassing many other aspects of what we are in life. It's about, it's your humor, it's, it's your imagination, it's all of these things. So that's where I look at spirituality. So one of the things that's important to me in a spiritual aspect for optimal health, and I'm going to use a quote from Mark Twain, who uh, was an American author and humorist. His actual name is Samuel Langhorne Clemens. Uh, he was the author of uh, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, The Adventures of Mark Twain, of Tom Sawyer, sorry, uh, and many other books. But he wrote a book. Uh, he made a quote, sorry. And the quote is, the two most important days in your life are the day you were born and the day you find out why. And I really like that because when I look at life right now, 
I think we're born with a gift, a mission, and a responsibility. The gift we have is that amazing brain and central nervous system surrounded by all the other uh, systems that allow us to move around, get food, have sensations, eat, uh, everything else that we do. So that's our gift. Our mission is to figure out why we're here and what we need to do about it on this planet. And our responsibility is to take care of ourselves so that we can uh, accomplish our mission. So for me, my mission, I learned at an early age, was to be in healthcare and about health and healing. And I stayed on that mission, and I was happy with that, and that's brought me joy through my entire life. Even at the point when, uh, after 30 years in emergency medicine, uh, due to uh, karmic and cosmic events. I was unable to practice in the emergency department anymore. I still felt like I wanted to have an active life and be professional and figure out what I wanted to do. So I went back to my mission again. And that's where I realized that I still wanted to be in health and I still wanted to be in health care. And uh, I came up with the idea to be a medical guide, something that nobody else has done, and I'm still doing that and enjoying that as a medical guide. So I had my mission. And I think the thing here to talk about for just a few minutes is that it's very important for each person to find the reason why they are here and then go with that and make that your joy and make that your passion throughout your life. And I think that in itself has helped me to be essentially healthy most of my life. What are your thoughts? I am right with you on that. I, I, I do believe that, um, you know, that mission, I, I think that is where a lot of people become lost or confused. Um, and I think p part of it could be that when people say, well, what am I here for? And I've heard this over and over again. Um, I, I always say to them, what brings you joy? Mm. You know, what, what brings you joy? Like, like uh, I, I know of several people said to, got very upset when we use the word passion because it's being overused these days. Mm -hmm. But when you say to someone, what brings you joy? Um, and the interesting part is I've had several people who look at me and go, I don't know. Because I, I, I believe that they were brought up in a generations where, you know, you live, you work, you have responsibilities, and that's been the mindset. That they were so encased in that way of living, in that way of life, that what is really joyful? Because it was, it would have been selfish to um pursue what actually brought you joy that's true and again when we talk about the six categories you know if you think about the others like if you don't eat good nutritional food and in mm -hmm. a healthy manner you're probably not going to be healthy if mm -hmm. you don't exercise your bones are going to get weak muscles and tendons are not going to do well joints are going to stiffen up and in each of these categories, you can trace a path towards optimal health or illness. And that's why spirituality is a, an important mm. aspect of this, because you can imagine a person who has their mission and who has their joy emotionally uh, is going to be happier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that happiness translates into another aspect of optimal health. Whereas mm -hmm. if you look at the opposite and you see someone, I don't know what I'm going to be. I'm not happy in this job. I have this job. I did it because my parents wanted me to do it. Uh, now I'm doing this because I have, uh, you know, I have a spouse and two kids and I have insurance and I can't get out of it and I have to do this and I have to stay here and I hate it. That person is not going to be happy. And ultimately they're going to manifest with intestinal illnesses, gast uh, gastrointestinal GI problems or headaches and uh, all sorts of things. So that's why 
I wanted to just touch on spirituality a little bit Mm -hmm. as a major important aspect. And again, you know, religion is certainly a part of spirituality, but it's not necessarily the whole thing for everybody. Yes, yes, absolutely. So so it's important. Mm. And and it's for optimal health, and it's got to be addressed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the and it should be part of a child's growing up process to find their reason for being here. What is it? I was fortunate uh, at a very early age to find that out, and that made my life better. And the people that I see <clears throat> that have their mission and are following their mission, and you can look at most of the people that we've interviewed on this show. Mm, yes. Uh, one of the reasons that the first set of questions we always ask about the heart and soul of that person, Mm -hmm. you could see and you can feel in their descriptions that they found their mission and that they're happy in it. Certainly things can happen periodically that you're not quite happy in certain parts, but in the overall aspect, we're good. Yeah, absolutely. Want to go to the third part or stay on mission? Speed. Speed. <laughs> My middle name, Speed. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, and we may change it. It's it's really pace. Uh, okay. W- I didn't know if I, you were going to go speed as in drugs or speed as in pace of life. <laughs> well, you know, I, I got to say that uh, Segovia has taught me that uh, it's, it's all about... Uh, optical responses and and people googling and and <laughs> trying to get people to so we have to look for keywords all the time so if you know if i use the word speed there would be we'd have a certain group of people that would think it was the drug group oh great, let's talk about this then we'd have the other people that love driving cars fast and and running those people and so i was trying to get as many people as possible and then uh, talk about actual pace and pace is what I really want to talk about, and the ability to develop a skill modulating your pace. Mm. And the first thing that is required in this, and this is actually, in a way, my health tip for today, is to look at yourself and be able to analyze yourself and what pace you usually run at. And when I say run, I don't mean the actual act of running. I mean just the act of existing. So when you're walking, when you're talking, when you're eating, all of these things, what pace are you working at? When you're sitting at a table, are you the first one finished with your meal while everyone is still on the appetizer? When you're walking, are you ahead of everyone or behind everyone? When you're talking, are you talking so fast that people aren't understanding? Or are you talking so slow that people are <laughs> falling asleep when listening to you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm told that I should speak faster on this show. <laughs> so, That's okay. We can just speed you up when we're listening yeah, to it. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. But the, the, the first aspect is to recognize what pace you naturally travel at. I remember once I was with a friend of mine during my internship. He was a uh, he was my chief resident, and he was uh, he was a former track star in high school and college. So naturally, he was one of these people that walked really fast. <clears throat> and we were walking one day in the city, and we were going to a restaurant that I was uh, going to introduce him to that he had never been to. But because he walked so fast, he was about 15 (laughs) feet ahead of me. (laughs) So I I yelled up to him. I said, hey, where are you going? And he looked back at me and said, I don't know. I'm just following you. (laughs) (laughs) That's good. (laughs) Yeah. So so you have to first recognize what pace you're at. And then you always hear people saying slow down or speed up or do something like that. What I'm... uh, promoting here is to learn the skill of modulation. So if you're walking at whatever pace you're at, recognize it. And then sometimes if you're with someone who may not be able to walk as fast, recognize that and learn how to walk slower for a little while and just enjoy it. If you're walking with someone who's faster than you, then pick up the pace a little bit. Same thing with eating, talking, and everything else that you do. And the reason I talk about modulation of pace is that 
especially when somebody gets sick or injured, most of the time it's walk it off, get back to work, you know, get back on the court, get back on the field, do this. I don't agree with that. I think that when you get sick or injured, it's time to slow down and allow your body to heal. So if you have the skill of being able to recognize your pace and then have the skill of being able to modulate it slower or faster, in these particular cases, knowing that slowing down is a good idea for a little while so that you can heal better, that's what I want you to start thinking about. Recognize your pace and learn how to modulate it. If you can imagine, Christina, working in an emergency department, so here I am at any given moment, uh, the emergency department, and in some cases, there are some emergency departments that are always busy and always full. But in many cases, in rural areas and small towns, you may find places where the emergency department may have nobody in it for a certain amount of time. And then uh, the pace picks up a little bit, and you have two or three or four people in it. And then all of a sudden, you can go from having nobody in there to getting a call from the paramedics that there's been a, a collision with a bus, a school bus, and uh, two other cars. There's 50 kids coming in that are going to be of various states of burns and injuries and everything else. And you have to ramp up and modulate up to a higher speed to work with that. Mm -hmm. But once that's over, you don't want to remain at that speed anymore. Mm -hmm. So you need to be able to recover and modulate. So the, the sooner you learn the skill of recognizing your pace, recognizing your natural pace, and then learn to modulate up or down at various times, that's my health tip for today. Mm, love it. I think that's brilliant. I was going to say, oh, walking. Hmm, depends. New York City, fast. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. LA, nobody walks, so everything seems fast. <laughs> yeah, it's funny too. And and also, you know, the faster you do things, I remember back in the 60s and 70s, there was this bumper sticker where everybody was taking, uh, not everybody, but people were taking speed. Uh, <laughs> and it was causing lots of damage, uh, seizure yes. disorders, oh. um, a lot of problems. Uh, from the speed. So mm. there's a big bumper sticker that said speed kills. <laughs> and in actuality, there's a very good chance that the faster you're going, be it in a, in a car uh, or running or going mm. through, uh, you know, an airport, the more chance you have of slipping, injuring, hitting someone else, causing problems. So if you're always moving fast, it's a good idea to recognize that and learn how to modulate and slow down. Mm, mm, good point. And I, there you go. I, I wish I wish I'd taken that to heart many years ago. <laughs> but since then, I've learned to modulate. <laughs> yeah, you know, it is interesting when I think about uh, a lot of the things we're going to talk about. Sometimes it's directed towards kids. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you're yes. trying to develop a career, if you, I think it's a great idea to learn how to modulate as a child. But even spirituality and finding your mission, all of these things certainly should come at a certain point early on, the earlier the better. But even if they don't come at a certain point, keep looking. Mm -hmm. And at the time that you do find it, the your future will be better because of that. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. It's never too late, is it? Well, <laughs> well, I don't think it's ever too late. <laughs> uh, uh, it may, depending on your philosophy, Yeah. Uh, you know, it may or may not be. Well, hopefully nothing happens to the individual before they learn. <laughs> but then so again, sometimes the we have show, to learn huh? the hard way, don't we? <laughs> yeah. I, I just got this, uh, listen to this. I love this. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, baby. Yeah. Oh, I got a new <laughs> yes button. A new yes button. I love it. Christmas present for my wife. Ah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. That's all she that. wants you to say is yes. No, I. this is when I ask her a question, I push the button and it's the answer for me. Oh, I see. <laughs> so I use it to my own advantage. I love it. Yeah. Uh, we're coming to the end of our show? Yes, it is. And you're already given your health tip. Do you have another one? Uh, listen to Christina 
all the time. <laughs> Only when I'm laughing, okay. <laughs> <laughs> laughing and bouncing. <laughs> laughing and bouncing, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for uh, tuning in today. We're happy to be here with you. Uh, I'm very thankful to all of my healers and to my teachers for allowing me to be on my mission. Uh, and we look forward to being with you uh, next week as we explore another quadrant of the healthcare galaxy. And until that time, I wish you and all the people in Yoga Hub, all of our listeners and viewers and everyone out there, optimal health. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Glenn Woolman, for another magnificent look into the doctor's bag. And uh, we would, of course, like to thank each and every one of you for joining us in this new platform of education and information. We're grateful for your continuous support, and we look forward to hearing your feedback on how we can serve you better. You can connect with Dr. Glenn Woolman through his website, glennwoolman.com, where I really encourage you to learn about his metaphor, square breath. Now, if you're listening um, to this on a podcast or through the computer, we would really love for you to share the link with other people um, that you feel would benefit from the show. Uh, would gr We would be grateful if you would like us, um, you know, through iTunes or uh, through uh, the site and make a comment. That would be really wonderful. But most important, it's about sharing the information. And that's, um, you know, creating the community where we can all support each other. We're always grateful for your feedback and comments and suggestions. If you'd like to hear about any new topics, um, just give us a call at 818-LET'S-TALK. 818-LET'S-TALK. Until next time, namaste. In the natural and homeopathic model of, of healing, there is such a respect for the human body and for that doctor inside us that we assume that whatever symptoms we have aren't the result of breakdown of the body, but they're the effort of our body to try and defend itself and to try and heal. Now, that doesn't mean that that symptom, that fever, that headache, that high blood pressure will necessarily heal us but that it is an effort of our body-mind to try and defend itself and to try and heal.